Hello, this is an English lesson for the first grade of high school. Our topic for today is map reading. My name is Jasna Dobrotic and I will be your teacher today. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to recognize the most common types of thematic maps, their characteristics and what you can find in them. You are also going to write a short description of your treasure map. You will need a notebook, something to write with, a mobile phone, a computer or a laptop, the internet and a QR code scanner. You can pause the video anytime you like, of course. So let's get started. I hope that a lot of students from all over Croatia are watching this lesson. Where do you live? Is it in a city? In a town? In a village? On an island? What's the name of your place? You are going to see some place names. Try to guess which ones are real and which ones are fake. Wigwig, Fatty Head, Pity Me, Nasty, Matching Tie, Beer. Believe it or not, they are all real. Now, the name you see in this photo is the name of a small village on Anglesey in North Wales, famous for being the place with the longest name in the UK, uh, and I'm sorry, but I can't pronounce it. Some people are the most famous for going to unfamiliar places and uncharted territories. This was Christopher Columbus the explorer who sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Ferdinand Magellan became the first European to cross the Pacific Ocean in 1521. Marco Polo may be the most storied Far East traveler, but he certainly was not the first. Without these famous people, our maps wouldn't look like they do today. You are going to read some statements about these famous explorers. Try to decide if they are true or false. Columbus set out to prove the Earth was round. False. The ancient Greeks had already proven it. By 1492, most educated people knew the planet was not flat. Columbus was not the first European to cross the Atlantic Ocean. True. The Norse Viking Leif Erikson is believed to have landed in present-day Newfoundland around 1000 AD. Nina and Pinta were not the actual names of two of Columbus' three ships. True. In 15th century Spain, ships were traditionally named after saints. Sailors, however, gave less decent nicknames to their ships. Mariners named one of the three ships the Pinta, Spanish for the painted one or prostitute. The Santa Clara was nicknamed the Niña in honor of its owner, Juan Niño. Magellan's expedition had a Portuguese crew. False. Spaniards and Portuguese made up the majority of the sailors, but the voyage also included sailors from Greece, Sicily, England, France, Germany, and even North Africa. Magellan gave the Pacific Ocean its name. True. After terrible storms near southern South America and losing one of his ships, Magellan finally entered what is now known as the Strait of Magellan in November 1520. Crossing into a calm and gentle ocean, he named it Mar Pacifico, which means peaceful sea in Portuguese. 
Marco Polo joined his father and uncle on their expedition because they were very close. False. A few months before Marco Polo was born in 1254, his father and uncle left Italy on a trading excursion to Asia. The brothers returned to Venice 15 years later, and it was only then that Marco finally met Niccolo, the father he never knew he had. Now think a bit. What kind of maps are there? Take a look at these maps. And what kind of information can you find on maps? There are various types of maps, and here are some of the most common ones. General reference maps portray landforms, national boundaries, bodies of water, the locations of cities, and so on. Political maps don't have any topographic features like mountains or desert. They focus solely on the state and national boundaries of a place and may also include the locations of small towns depending on the detail of the maps. Climate maps show information about the climate of an area as well as things like the specific climatic zones based on the temperature, the amount of snow an area receives, or the average number of cloudy days. What kind of information do more or less all maps include? Take a look at this map and try to figure out what five elements of any map are. Connect five map elements with the correct arrows. There are two arrows you do not need. And here is the answer key. Title, legend or key, grid, directions, scale. There are five elements of any map. The first one is the title. It gives basic information about the map, such as the area it represents. A map should always have the legend or key, which explains what symbols used on that particular map represent. For example, main roads, railway tracks and stations, gardens or arboretums, sites of historic battles, woods with non-coniferous trees. The third element is the grid, which is commonly the geographic grid system or latitude and longitude marks used to locate specific locations. Latitude is flat and longitude goes up and down. Your next element would be directions. It could be a compass rose or some other symbol used to indicate the cardinal directions of north, east, south, and west. There are two sentences that you can use to help you remember the main directions. Nobody ever swallows whales. Naughty elephants squirt water. There are several ways to express main directions. Take a look at these sentences. Paris is in the north of France. Canada is north of the USA. Belgium is to the north of France. Now you're going to insert four places into the correct sentences according to the main directions. You can pause the video and copy the sentences. And here's the answer key. Moscow is in the west of Russia. Mexico is south of the USA. Japan is to the east of China. Sweden is north of France. The last element of any map is the scale, which shows the relation between a certain distance on the map 
and the actual distance in real life. For example, one centimeter on the map can represent 250 meters in real life. So what can we find on a map? There are continents like Australia, which is both a continent and a country. Then Kenya, an example of a country. Capital cities like Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Mountains like the Ural Mountains in Russia. Lakes like the Caspian Lake, which is the world's largest inland body of water or the world's largest lake. Oceans like the Pacific Ocean. Seas like the Barents Sea. Rivers and the example of the Amazon River. Islands like Iceland, which is both a country and an island. And deserts. For example, the Atacama Desert in South America. Now it's time to pause the video for the Around the Globe quiz. Follow the link or scan the QR code and try to complete the challenge. I hope that you have been successful. There is a group of frequently occurring words used for describing size, distance and shape in geography. Take a look at this short text and pay attention to the underlined words. The town of Portonu is next to a river whose waterfall creates a shallow pool beneath the falling water. The length of the river is almost 46 kilometers and a lot of plants around it have deep roots in order to collect more water from the river. The river crust averages 2 kilometers in thickness and can be as thin as 1 kilometer in some areas. Tourism industry is located near the town of Portonu and provides employment for many people living nearby. There is also a mountain next to the town, which is normally over 400 meters in height. Now it's time to take your notebook and copy this table with words frequently used for measuring in geography. There are three parts of speech in the table adjectives, adverbs, and nouns. One word is given in each row and you have to fill in the missing words. Use a dictionary if necessary. And you can pause the video now. Now it's time to check your word formation table. The missing words are deep, deeply, depth, shallow, shallowly, shallowness near, near, nearness, long, long, length, thick, thickly, thickness, high, high or highly, and height or high. Now, let's use some of the words from the table. Copy these four sentences in your notebook and fill in the missing words. Of course, you can pause the video. The sentences should be completed in this way. The swimming pool has a deep end for swimmers and a shallow end for kids. We measured the length of our backyard. The ocean crust is 8 kilometers thick on average. The plane was flying at a height of 10,000 meters. Let's imagine we're in geography class. Listen to the teacher. As you see, North America is bigger than Europe, but smaller than Asia. Canada is in the north, and it is the second largest country in the world, following Russia. 
Americans usually joke that it is the most boring country in the world. I disagree, but it is definitely one of the coldest. Now find all the examples of comparison of adjectives. Where are the comparatives? It's bigger, smaller. And where are the superlatives? The largest, the most boring, the coldest. In geography, different places often get compared to one another, so it's time for a little bit of comparison of adjectives. Take a look at these sentences. The Alps are higher than Velebit. Canada is one of the coldest countries in the world. So, how are short adjectives compared? If adjectives are short, you have to use suffixes er and est. For example, high, higher, the highest, or shiny, shinier, the shiniest. If letter Y comes after a consonant, it changes into I. Or hot, hotter, the hottest. The final consonant is doubled if an adjective is short and has one vowel and one final consonant. You always have to use the definite article de in the superlative form. Take a look at these examples. The Mediterranean Sea is more beautiful than the North Sea. Americans joke that Canada is one of the most boring countries in the world. How would you compare long adjectives? If adjectives are long, you have to use the words more and the most. For example, accurate, more accurate, the most accurate. So pay attention to this sentence. Zagreb is further north than Karlovac. Where is the comparative form? It's further. And what is the positive form or the non-comparative form of further? It's far. Some adjectives are irregular, like the adjective far. Far, further, the furthest. Or good, good, better, the best. Or bad, worse, the worst. Now let's go through everything once again. Pause the video, click on the link or scan the QR code and try to complete the breakout challenge. Good luck! I hope you've got inspired because it's time to choose one place in the world and write a short composition where you are going to describe your own treasure map. First, choose an intriguing name for your map. For example, the Cursed Captain's treasure map. Then choose where you're going to bury your treasure, on an island, in a town, or a forest, and say the name of this place. Now choose at least seven map symbols that lead to the treasure. There are plenty to choose from on this page. You can follow the link or again scan the QR code. Now describe where you have placed your symbols on the map. Use directions which include north, east, south, west, and or comparison of adjectives. For example, the lighthouse is to the west of the island. The nature reserve is towards the north. The marshes are south of the island center. The site of battle is further east than the castle. The sand pit is larger than the gravel pit. If you are really into treasure maps, you could make a real treasure map. You could draw it or use digital tools. You could also send your map description to your classmate and let him or her Make a drawing of your map according to your description. 
and you could also try to make a drawing of his or her map as well. And this is the end of our lesson. I hope you like it. Here's the checklist for your activities and I hope it will be full of smileys. Goodbye!